How many of you like mysteries and secrets? Fantastic. Because I love mysteries and secrets, you can put your hands down. Thank you. And uh, ever since I was uh, a child and I was going to school, I'd always be looking for mysteries and secrets. So I'm going to share some of those mysteries and secrets with you today. Um, I'm going to take you on a tour around the world. And uh, I'm pretty sure that what I'm going to tell you today, most of it you would not have heard of. And I know this because uh, I've interacted with so many children around the world and very few people know about all these things. But um, I'm going to start by telling you a story because I'm a writer, right? I'm going to take you to France, to Paris in 1868. The caretaker of a building walks up to the top floor of the building. The building only has rooms. These are the rooms which are occupied by poor people in the 19th century in Paris, people who can't afford a house. One of the rooms, the occupants of one of the rooms has not been seen for a few days. So the caretaker has gone to see what happened to him. He knocks on the door. There's no reply. He pushes the door. It's locked from inside. So he decides to break it down. After he breaks down the, the door and he walks into the room, what he sees is the typical room in that building. It's a small, dark, dirty room, a poor man's room. One bed, one table, and a coal gas stove. That's it. And on the bed, he sees the body of a 29-year-old man whose name was Abel Babin. Now, it was clear to the caretaker that Abel Babin had committed suicide. And then the investigation also showed that it was, you know, the coal gas stove, he had used it to suffocate himself to death. But why had he taken his own life? Was it because he was poor? Was it because he was lonely? Or was it because of an error that happened 30 years ago? The medical examination showed that 30 years before he was born in April 1838, seven months before, he was born. A single error occurred which was a genetic mutation in his body. This genetic mutation caused an enzyme in his body to fail. How do we know this? Because today we have the technology to analyze the medical records of the 19th century. And it is very clearly stated in the records that when Abel Babin's mother held her baby for the first time after he was born, she did not hold a baby boy, but she held a baby girl. Strange. Abel Babin was born as a girl and he died as a man. How can this happen? This is reality. I'll come back to this. There is science behind this, but I write fiction. Today, I'm going to give you facts. And I will show you the evidence for all the facts that I state. Wherever I am going to speculate, I will tell you I am speculating, but that is not going to be very often because I speculate through my books. Let me take you deep into the past. What is this? Excellent. You all, very recognizable building. This is a 457 foot high building, <coughs> which means it, it is a skyscraper. <coughs> Sorry. It is 45 stories in height. We are told that this was built by a pharaoh, a king of Egypt called Khufu, who built this as a tomb for himself. He wanted to be buried in this after he died. Built in 2550 BC. Now, what's not very commonly known is that the original entrance to the Great Pyramid, which you can see here, was hidden away for centuries. No one knew where it was. They knew that there was a secret entrance, but they didn't know where it was. Even today, you cannot enter through this. You can see it's blocked with huge stones. Today, when you go as a tourist to Egypt, you enter the Great Pyramid using this entrance, which was made in 820 AD by the Caliph Abdullah al-Mamun. Now, no one knows why al-Mamun wanted to go inside the Great Pyramid. Some people say he wanted to go there because of the knowledge that the Great Pyramid is supposed to contain. Some people say he went there because if Khufu was buried there, there would be lots of treasure inside. But it doesn't matter why he went there. What's interesting is that his, the opening he created to get inside the Great Pyramid was actually directly below the original entrance. But that didn't help him because when he went inside, he found nothing. 
There was absolutely nothing. The empty, the Great Pyramid was empty. No body of Khufu. Khufu had never been buried there. No one else had ever been buried there. There was no treasure. And there were no inscriptions on the walls. There was no nothing. No knowledge. Nothing. Instead, what you see in the Great Pyramid, what he saw and what we see today, is this very strange network of chambers and passages. See this, there's a ground, underground chamber at the bottom, there's a middle chamber which the Arabs called the Queen's Chamber and then the top chamber is called the King's Chamber. And notice that all the tunnels, the passages leading to these chambers, out of all of them only one is horizontal. All the others are at very sharp, very steep sloped, 26 or 27 degree inclines. What does this mean? Uh, let me show you. Let's start with the grand, I'm taking you inside the Great Pyramid now. Let's start with the Grand Gallery. This is a photograph. You can see how, how difficult it would be to climb this. Today, they have wooden stairs and handrails, so you can climb it easily. But in the olden days, without the stairs and the handrail, you can see how difficult it would have been to climb this sheer stone passage. No stairs. Let me show you another one. To enter the King's Chamber, which is where Khufu's body was supposed to have been buried, you have to pass through a small room which is known as the anteroom. Why? Because it's a room before the main room. That's all. Now let's close up over here. Let's go. Let's zoom in and see. This is interesting. You walk through the grand, grand gallery. You saw how high the ceiling was? And then to get into the king's chamber, you have to crawl through the antechamber, through a tunnel, until you enter the king's chamber. This tunnel on the right hand side, this opening is the, the mouth of the tunnel. This is how you enter the king's chamber, by crawling through it. Let me show you another entrance. The entrance to the horizontal passage which leads to the second chamber, the middle chamber, the queen's chamber. You can see it's underneath the grand gallery and here it is. Can you see that opening underneath the grand gallery? On top is that gentleman who was climbing up and below there's a small opening. Again, you have to crawl through this to reach the Queen's Chamber. Every chamber in the Great Pyramid, you can reach only by crawling through these passages. Why did Khufu build a building like this? He built it 45 stories high, left it empty and sealed it so no one could go inside. What was going on in his mind? We don't know, but we know some other interesting things and there are lots. I can spend a week talking about the Great Pyramid. I'm just going to share a couple of things. Now, you know that a pyramid, how many sides does a pyramid have apart from the base? Four sides. Four sides, right? Yeah. Notice the Great Pyramid compared to the second pyramid, which is known as the Pyramid of Kafe. Can you see that there are two sides over here? It's concave. Each side of the Great Pyramid is concave. The Great Pyramid has eight sides, not four. And this photograph was taken a hundred years ago when the first flights started. This is one of the first, this is the first aerial photograph of the Great Pyramid. And suddenly they realized that at a certain angle when the sun shines on it, you can actually see that there are two sides to each side of the Great Pyramid, eight sides. And here in this more modern photograph again, you can see that line running through the center of the face. So, eight sides. <coughs> okay, more mysteries. Let's walk over to the Sphinx. It's a few hundred meters away. 240 feet in length, 66 feet in height. It's the height of a seven-story building. It's enormous. We are told it was built by Khafre, son of Khufu, in 2500 BC. And the face is supposed to be the face of Khafre. Now, I don't know whether it's supposed to be handsome or not, but you can judge for yourself. Right? But the face is the face of Khafre. And for most of its existence, the great, the Sphinx, as it's called, has been covered in sand up to the shoulders, with just the neck and the head visible. In 1991, a scientist, Dr. Robert Schock, who at that time was a professor of geology at Boston University, uh, he's a double PhD in geology, his speci speciality is erosion of rocks. He was called into Egypt to try and validate the date when the Sphinx was built. Now, I just told you, Egyptologists say that it was built in 2500 by Khafre. So he was called in to scientifically validate it. Was it actually built in 2500 BC? So Dr. Robert Schock spent a year running scientific tests on the Sphinx. And in 1992, he made an announcement. And I'm going to show you what he said. Because it's a bit amazing. Look at the body of the Sphinx. Can you see those horizontal lines? 
that's erosion right yes. and if you look at the walls surrounding the sphinx there's erosion on the walls also you can see the horizontal lines and can you see it's quite similar let's let's zoom in here horizontal lines and those vertical cracks robert shock said based on his scientific tests these lines of erosion on the body and the wall surrounding the sphinx were not caused by wind or sand erosion which you would assume would happen because Egypt is a semi-desert but they were caused by heavy rainfall. This is crazy yeah? because in 2500 BC it wasn't raining much in Egypt about the same as it is today. It was dry. Not enough rainfall to cause this kind of erosion. The last time it has actually rained heavily in Egypt was when the Sahara Desert was a tropical forest or more accurately equatorial forest. It's closer to the equator. The 3000 years between 5000 and 8000 BC, which we call the Neolithic subpluvial in geological terms, was the last time it rained heavily enough for this kind of erosion to happen. And Dr. Robert Schock was basically saying that the Sphinx could not have been built in 2500 BC because that erosion would not have happened. It had to have been built much before 5000 BC because it takes a couple of thousand years for erosion to happen. It doesn't happen overnight. So the Sphinx, he said, is at least eight to 9,000 years old. But who built the Sphinx eight to 9,000 years ago then? Because we were hunter-gatherers, we had primitive stone tools, not good enough to carve a monument like this out of the hill. Uh, you know, this was carved out of a hill. Okay, let's move on. Let me now take you to England, Stonehenge. These stones that you can see in the outer circle of Stonehenge, each of them weighs 70 tons, seven zero even the ones on top and the ones on top have been lifted to a height of about 20 or 25 feet and placed on top of the standing stones. Now everyone talks about the mysteries of Stonehenge, who built it, why was it built? But in 2015 when I was researching for my, my book The Secret of the Druids, I spent a week at Stonehenge with two archaeologists and I asked them lots of questions and because I was paying them, they answered most of them. Uh, I'll tell you the one that they didn't answer. It's a very interesting question. But basically, I, I asked them, how did these people in 2400 BC when Stonehenge was built, 4400 years ago, how did they lift 70 ton blocks of stones and put them on top? Because the British government in the 1950s restored Stonehenge, or part of it. Because the, the Romans had come in in, the, in about 60 to 80 AD and they had destroyed Stonehenge. So the British government rebuilt part of it using cranes. But in 2400 BC, were there cranes? No. no. So I asked them, I said, how did they do it? So they gave me a very good answer. They said, well, just imagine this, seven, uh, a 70 ton block of stone, 100 men lifting one block of stone using ropes. Fair enough, ropes and pulleys, right? So they pulled and pulled, lifted the stone 20 feet into the air, put it on top. Sounds good. But then when you look at the engineering of Stonehenge, a different picture emerges and then that's when I realized that for me at least, the real mystery of Stonehenge is not who built it or why it was built, but how was it built? Look at this, the standing stones have these two projections, they're known as tenons and the holes on top and the stones flat on top are called mortise holes. In carpentry, this is called a mortise tenon joint. It makes sense because Stonehenge originally was not a stone circle, it was a wood circle. There were wooden poles, so they probably used the same wooden joints in stone. What does the mortise tenon joint do? It locks pieces in place, you know, like Legos. So the, those are the tenons and these are the mortise holes. Uh, so the Stonehenge builders were actually locking the stones on top so that they wouldn't fall off. You don't want 70 ton blocks of stone falling off now when you're walking below it. So that's one, they, but they were smart. They had a second lock. On the side of the stones, you can see what is known as a tongue and groove joint. The tongue slides into the groove and locks it from the side just like a jigsaw puzzle does. So they had two locks to ensure the stones didn't fall off. Very smart. But here is the question of how. So imagine this, just picture this in your mind. A 70 ton block of stone, 100 men pull it up to 20 feet high in the air. Now because it's 20 feet high in the air, it's uh, the height of a two-story building approximately, you can't see what's happening on top. So through trial and error, they maneuver this massive stone which is swaying. As you pull it, it sways because of momentum. 
and they managed to place it so that the mortise tenon joint locks. So far, so good. It's probably taken them the whole day to do this, but they do it. Now they have to put the second stone in place. And the challenge here is that both the joints have to lock at the same time. The mortise tenon and the tug and groove have to lock at the same time. Now when you're putting a Lego piece, Lego set together, do you do it like this or do you do it like this? Yeah. But these guys were, were doing it like this. They could not see what was happening. It's like closing your eyes and trying to construct something from a Lego set. How did they do it? So when I asked the archaeologists, this is the question they did not answer. They told me, we are not engineers, so we can't answer you. So I said, fair enough. I'm not going to ask any more questions. But let me show you photographs. You can see the mortar soles very clearly. Here you can see a tenon. And here, if you look very closely, you can see the tongue from a tongue and groove joint. The other stone with the groove would have fallen off when the Romans destroyed Stonehenge. Let's now go to Lebanon, Baalbek. This is the wall of the Temple of Jupiter. And just to give you an idea of how huge this wall is, look at that man standing in the bottom left of the screen. Can you see him? Yeah, it shows you how big this wall is. And here, here is another photograph to show you. Those are not ants, those are men, fully grown men. And I want to show you these, I want to talk about these stones, the big ones right below, these three. Now you can see that these three stones have been lifted to around 20 feet and put on top of a wall, right? There are smaller stones underneath. Why am I so fascinated with these stone, three stones? Sorry? Ah, that's a question. And let me make it more complicated for you. Each of these three stones weighs 840 tons, 12 times the weight of Stonehenge. And, uh, and this is interesting because, you know, in the 21st century, this is our, the largest crane in the world. It's a German crane. It's used for living, lifting very heavy weights. The maximum capacity of this crane, lifting capacity, the maximum weight it can lift is 825 tons. Today in the 21st century, we cannot lift those stones. So who put them there? It was done in the past. Who was able to lift 820, uh, 840 tons of stone and put them on top of a wall? Let me show you more. Where, if you go to where the stones came from, where they were cut out of the rock, you see this stone still there. It was not used because there's a big crack in it. Can you see the crack? So they probably thought it will weaken the structure of the wall and they didn't use it. This stone weighs 1,150 tons. If you go to the other side of the stone, in 2016, I think, um, February 2016, if I remember correctly, they discovered another stone in the ground still, but cut. It hasn't been taken out. And that one weighs 1,650 tons. So my little joke is it was too heavy for them to lift. So they left it in the ground. 1,600. We can only lift 800, 1,000 ton stones. We can't lift 1,600 tons. But this is amazing. Somebody in the past was playing with huge stones with which we in the 21st century cannot lift. What were they doing and how did they do it? Now here's a very amazing fact. This is a fact, but it's a coincidence. It's got to be a coincidence. If you take the, the, the Great Pyramid and look at it from Google Earth from on top, and if you draw the diagonals, northward diagonals, this is what you see. One diagonal points towards Baalbek, the 840 ton stones I just showed you, the wall of Jupiter, and the other one points towards Stonehenge. Amazing coincidence, right? Yes. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that 4,000 or 5,000 years ago, these guys had a WhatsApp group, the builders of Stonehenge, Baalbek, and they say, hey, I'm building, I'm building the Great Pyramid, I'm building a wall, the wall of Temple of Jupiter. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm building a stone circle. Okay, let's make them, you know, let's make a triangle out of them. No, that's not what they were doing. I, I'll take questions later. Please remember your questions, I'll take questions later. Uh, because I've got a lot to show you. Okay, so, I've given you some mysteries. Now I'm going to share with you three amazing discoveries which I'm almost 100% certain you've not heard of because I've not seen them in any textbooks anywhere in the world. And these discoveries are all based on scientific evidence and I will share that evidence with you. The first one is, we now know that in about 10,500 to 10,800 BC, the Earth was hit by an extraterrestrial object, a comet or a meteor or an asteroid. Let's assume it was a meteor to make it simple, right? 
uh, because I'm, I'm not going to keep saying an extraterrestrial body, it could be a comet meteor. I just say it's a meteor. Now, when the meteor passed through the Earth's atmosphere, it broke up into small fragments, and these fragments hit the Earth's surface at different points. These are the points where it hit the Earth's surface. 12,000 years ago, you must remember that the Ice Age was ending. It started ending 15,000 years ago. The ice caps were melting, but there was a pretty solid ice cap kilometers deep over North America and Greenland, that was one huge ice cap. Over northwards of Spain was all one big, uh, Europe was one big ice cap. And you can see the fragments largely landed on the ice cap. So two things happened. The first was with the impact and the heat, the ice caps melted. Sea levels rose by 100 to 200 feet. Sea levels were anyway rising because the ice age was en ending and the ice caps were melting, like it is today. So, there was a global flood 12,000 years ago with the, because the sea levels went 200 feet up, drowning coastal areas. Is that the flood that is reflected in the 2,000 flood myths all over the world? We don't know, but we do know that this global flood happened. The second thing that happened, and this is one of the evidences for that, the scientific reports. The other thing that happened was, as the fragments of the meteor hit the, the earth, it was like millions of nuclear bombs going off at the same time across the world. The planet shook. There were earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, dust was thrown up into the atmosphere. The sun was blacked out. It was hidden for 1,300 years. And what happened? There was an artificial winter. Today we call this the impact winter. This impact of the, the, uh, the meteor is known as the Younger Dryas event. And let me show you this. This is a, um, a report taken in the year 2000 of an ice core sample from the Greenland ice cap. You know what geologists do? They drill deep into the ice, kilometers deep, take out ice samples and then analyze it to see what was happening in, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere and on the Earth thousands of years ago. Look at the red line. 20,000 years ago, it's minus 45 degrees centigrade, the ice age, 45 to 47 degrees. Then 15,000 years ago, global warming happens, the temperatures rise to minus 30, but then 12,000 years ago, suddenly the temperature falls to minus 50. It suddenly becomes colder than the Ice Age. This is not natural. This is when the meteor hit the earth. This is when the impact winter started. The sun was blacked out. For 1,300 years, the temperatures remained between 48 and minus 48 and minus 50 degrees centigrade, colder than the Ice Age. Then when the dust in the atmosphere settled, the sun came out, global warming started again, and temperatures went back to minus 30. The second interesting discovery I wanted to share with you, Turkey, Gobekli Tepe. Now this site was discovered in 1994 and I'm really, really surprised that for 28 years, excavations have been happening here and it's not in your history textbooks. I am amazed. And I'm also amazed that this is the only site in the world where all archaeologists agree on when it was built. There's no dispute. Remember the Sphinx I told you, somebody says 2,500, Dr. Robert Shock said, no, no, no. It's um, uh, much, much older. It's uh, 8,000 or 9,000. Here, everyone agrees based on scientific testing. And they all say this was built around 10,000 BC, shortly after the meteor strike. Th those are not connected, but just to give you a perspective. 10,000 BC, but it's not in our history textbooks. I don't know why. Now, you can see what's, what's charming about Gobekli Tepe, stone circles. Lots of them, but not like Stonehenge. Stonehenge had these huge stones which were cut and placed. Here, they've been carved. They've been carved into T-shapes. These are known as anthropomorphic which means they have the human form. So there are, there are hands drawn on them. There are belts drawn on them. There are symbols which we cannot interpret. There are inscriptions on them. And there are drawings of animals in them which never lived in Turkey. So we don't know how they got there, the, the, the carvings. How did they know what they looked like? And all these stone circles are aligned to the stars. Whoever built this had to have had a knowledge of astronomy and engineering to make it so precise. So what's happened now is traditionally we are taught and you're still taught in schools that uh, human civilization started 6,000 years ago with uh, Sumeria, Egypt and the Indus Valley. But Gobekli Tepe shows us that 
actually human civilization started 10,000 BC because an uncivilized society could not have built such a sophisticated monument. It was people like us who were civilized, who were living in a civilized community. Third, the third discovery. This is a photograph taken in 2008 of archaeologists in a cave in Russia called Denisova. While they were excavating, they discovered some bones, some large bones belonging to a finger and they discovered a gigantic tooth, two and a half times the size of our human teeth, huge tooth. So they thought it belongs to a large extinct animal and they sent it to Geneva for DNA testing. Uh, the person who tested this actually won the Nobel Prize this year. So um, the test results came back and imagine the shock of the archaeologists when the test results told them that this is a human tooth. It belonged to a girl who lived and died around 40,000 years ago. And she belonged to a human species which before 2009 when this discovery was made, we didn't know about them. Today we call them the Denisovans. Uh, and there's a bit of a dispute about how you pronounce this, Denisovans or Denisovans, it doesn't matter. It's the, it's the find that's really, really amazing. So the Denisovans lived a long time back. Remember this tooth was enormous, right? More and more fragments of bones, skulls, teeth have been found of Denisovans. Uh, they mysteriously disappeared about 30 to 40,000 years ago, unless in the future we find more fossils after that. But they seem to have just disappeared. We don't know why. And we've never found a complete skeleton. So we really don't know what a Denisovan really looked like. Though it is speculated based on, again, I'm speculated, this is, there's no evidence for this, but it's fun to speculate this. It's speculated that they were actually very big people, maybe 9 to 11 feet in height, just based on their teeth and their bones and so on. Now, maybe we find a skeleton and say that this is all wrong. Maybe they were shorter or taller. We don't know. But let me tell you about this bracelet. It's a stone bracelet which was found along with that girl's tooth and her bones, her finger bones. See the hole at the side of the bracelet? So she probably wore it around her arm, if it was hers, and this was used as a fashion accessory. This hole is just one millimeter in diameter. Even if you put your finger and thumb together, you can't measure one millimeter. It's so fine. So scientists were a bit puzzled. How did the Denisovans drill this hole without breaking the stone? 40,000 years ago, they had primitive technology, right? They couldn't have drilled this. So they ran tests. And this is what their report says. I'm quoting from the report now, right? They say that this hole could only have been made by using a two-faced drill operating at a very high speed. Now, this doesn't mean that they had electricity and, you know, the kind of drills, power drills we had today. But they had a technology which should not have been there 40,000 years ago. They are our cousins. The Denisovans, we are Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens discovered this technology thousands of years after them. It's still a primitive technology compared to our technology today. But the Denisovans were way ahead of us in terms of technology. Uh, there are other things, but I, I don't have time for that today. I just wanted to share this with you. This is the whole uh, that I'm talking about. And scientists have attempted very recently, now, now there's more and more evidence about the Denisovans. They've tried to reconstruct what a Denisovan could have looked like and maybe this is what that girl looked like. We don't know, but this is possibly what a Denisovan looked like. Now, you know, um, as an author, I kept, when I was doing this research, this is all in the West, and I kept thinking to myself, we read about some pretty fantastic stories in the Mahabharat. And I kept wondering to myself, can, can we actually connect science and the Mahabharat? Yes. And I started researching science in ancient India. And I'm just going to share a couple of things with you. I found a lot of very interesting things. I'll just share a couple of things. Let me start with the Vedic age. If you read the Vedas, you will realize that in Vedic times, people did not worship in temples. They worshipped in altars like this one. You can see the fire. The fire was the central ritual. And it was always done on an altar when the, where the fire worship was done. Altars came in different shapes and sizes. This is called Shenachiti. It's a falcon-shaped altar. And you can see there are five rows of bricks. Each of these altars had 1,000 bricks in five rows. And this one has four different geometrical shapes. Now, this diagram is not there in the ancient text, but it's been created based on instructions in the Shulba Sutras. 
which are texts written between 600 to 800 BC, almost 3,000 years ago, which give instructions on how to build these altars. So the instructions are so precise that you can actually create this kind of a diagram. But you can't do this unless you know geometry, which means people those, in, those, in those times knew geometry. Indeed, the Shulba Sutras have a lot of arithmetic and geometry in them. The most famous example is from the Bodhaya and Shulba Sutra, 800 BC, which states what is today called the Pythagoras theorem in words. It's not in the form of an equation or a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. No, it's stated in words. But there are ways to interpret this and convert this into practical measurements and that's given in the Shulba Sutras. The third example I want to give you of science in ancient India is an ancient textbook on surgery written by India's first surgeon, Sushruta. And this contains instructions on all kinds of surgical procedures. One of them, at least one of them, there, there are more, but one of them, again, the most famous one I'm, is the one I'm quoting, is a technique of surgery, a plastic surgery, which is still used in the 21st century. Sushruta was doing it 3,000 years ago. We are doing it today. Today, we call it forehead flap rhinoplasty, where you take skin from the forehead and reconstruct the nose. And Sushruta was doing it um, 3,000 years ago. And this is pretty well acknowledged. If you look at Columbia University's website, for example, they talk about rhinoplasty and skin grafts happening 3,000 years ago. Now I'm going to come back to the story I started with. Evil Babe, the story of a man who was born as a girl. What, what's the mystery behind this? What, what ha actually happened? Is it real? Yes, it is real. There is a scientific fact behind it. Abel Babe is one of those unfortunate people who, who suffered from a very rare genetic condition. Remember I told you there was a genetic mutation, there was a failure of an enzyme. So I won't get into the clinical details of this. Uh, you, can, you can check it up uh, if you want. Uh, and I'll tell you other ways of getting inf this, the correct information. So Abel ba Babe had this condition which we clinically call male pseudohermaphroditism. This is a, a rare genetic condition because of the failure or absence of one enzyme in the body which is known as 5-alpha reductase. If this enzyme is not there, that person is born female and over the course of their lives, they naturally spontaneously become male. And that's what happened to Abel Barber. And as I was reading this research, Several years ago, actually, I was reading this in 2013, 12 or 13, I was reading this. It occurred to me that there's a story in the Mahabharata very similar to this. You know it? Yes. Which one? Krishna. Not Krishna. Not Krishna. Yes. So, I'll tell you the story very quickly. It's a fascinating story, but uh, try and see if you can see the science in it. Try and see if you can see Abel Baba's story in this. So, King Drupad prays to Lord Shiva for a boy. He wants a son to be the next king. Lord Shiva says, you will get a son. But when his child is born, he, ha he realizes it's a girl. He's got a daughter. So he's very upset. He goes back to Lord Shiva, prays again. Lord Shiva appears to him and Drupad says, Lord, you promised me a son, but I have a daughter. How can you not, go how can you go back on your promise? And Lord Shiva says something very mysterious. And this is a story from the Mahabharata, right? He says something very strange. He says, don't worry. This girl will be your son. What does that mean? Anyway, Drupad says, Lord Shiva said, I am going back. And he raises Shikandini as a boy, not as a girl. She is treated as a boy. So much so that when she reaches marriageable aid, age, Drupad marries her and gets her a wife. And of course, when the wife comes home, she realizes that she has been married to a woman, not a man. She is extremely upset. She informs her father who is furious. He says, Drupad has deceived me. And he takes his army and starts marching towards Drupad's capital. Shikantini is devastated. She says, there's going to be a war because of me. Most probably, my father is going to be defeated and killed. So, she wanders out of the palace. She goes into a forest nearby. And she cries. And that's when she uh, meets a yaksha called Stuna. Stuna comes to her. He's a nice guy. Right? So, he comes to her and says, why are you crying? So, Shikandini tells him the whole story and says, I don't know what to do. Stuna has a solution. Yakshas are magical beings, right? They've got magical powers. So, yaksh, uh, this Yaksha says, I have got a solution. It's a temporary solution, but at least it'll send your father-in-law back. It'll, it'll stop the war from happening. So, uh, what's the solution? He says to Shikandini, 
I will lend you my masculinity. So you will temporarily become a man and I will temporarily become a woman. So we'll swap. You go back to the palace, your father-in-law goes back and then you come back into the forest and give me back my masculinity and take back your femininity. Shikandini is desperate and she agrees. And that is how Shikandini walks out of the forest as Shikandin or Shikandi. But Stuna has a problem because Kubir, who is the king of the Yakshas, is angry with him. He says, you have interfered with nature. You have done something which is not correct. Just because you have the powers to do it, you can't, you just, you can't misuse them. And he curses Stuna. He says, you have made a choice and now you will live as a female forever. And Shikandin or Shikandi will, will live as a man forever. And that is how Shikandin becomes a man permanently. Now, I mean, there are ways of speculating about this. My way of thinking about this is, what if, um, what if Shikandini actually was a male pseudo-hermaphrodite? What if she was? What if she naturally changed genders? Imagine thousands of years ago, they didn't know about five alpha reductors then, right? We do, right? And now you do also, because I told you. But then they didn't know about it. Just, just imagine the princess becomes a prince. There's a scandal. Everyone is shocked. What's happening? So a story is built, a story is created that this is a blessing from Lord Shiva. The moment you say that, are people going to complain or question? No, they're just going to say, okay, if Lord Shiva has said, that's what it is. What if, what if there is a scientific explanation for this story? My last story before I conclude and then I'll be happy to, to, to hear your, uh, to get you to speak. How many of you heard of this, uh, this fire? this forest fire in the US last year? Anyone? Okay, some of you have heard of it. Great. Uh, this was a massive forest fire. It burned millions of hectares. It was a major disaster, very difficult to put out. But this, what was really amazing for me when I was reading these headlines was the headlines themselves. The fire was generating its own weather. The fire was generating rain. It was generating lightning. Is that even possible? But this is what was happening. And this is what made it very dangerous for firefighters to go out and put out the fire. And this is real. There is science behind this. Let me explain. So when a forest fire is not controlled and becomes uncontrollable, the fire clouds, the clouds of smoke, developed into, develop into bigger and bigger clouds until they start forming what are called pyrocumulus clouds. You've heard of cumulus clouds? Yes. Right? Pyro means fire. So pyrocumulus cloud is basically a cumulus cloud made from fire. And as they get bigger, they develop into pyrocumulonimbus clouds. And it is these clouds, the pyrocumulonimbus clouds, that can generate rain and lightning while the fire is raging. So you have the fire and, uh, okay, I'll just show you the picture. Uh, these are the pyrocumulus clouds. These clouds from their base to the top of the cloud can be around 6 miles in height. The cloud itself is 6 miles in height. Pyrocumulonimbus clouds can be even bigger, up to 10 miles in height. And this is what happens. The forest fire grows bigger and bigger. You can see how the clouds grow bigger, bigger. And you can see how the, the texture of the clouds is changing. Small clouds become bigger. They go higher and higher until they get in develop into these huge pyrocumulonimbus clouds. And that's when rain happens and lightning strikes happen and the fires at the same time. Just visualize this in your mind. Close your eyes and think about this picture. The fire is raging on the ground. There's heavy rain falling. There's lightning striking. What a fearful sight that is. And that's why the firefighters found it difficult to put out this fire. Now, while I was reading this last year, I remembered another story from the Mahabharat. Do you all know which one? When Arjuna and Krishna like Dandaka Dandaka. Not Dandaka. But you're pre that's pretty good. Yes, that's right. Great. So, um, so let me tell you the. Uh, let, let me show you what I saw, and you don't have to believe what I believed. You don't have to see. All I'm going to ask you is to open your mind and see. I'm going to show you the Sanskrit of the of, of the Mahabharata, the story in the Adi Parv, and I'm going to show you what I saw. In the, I'll translate the shlokas for you. And you tell me if you think it sounds like the bootleg fire or not. If you don't think it's, that's fine. But I thought 
<coughs> the picture painted by the story is pretty much like the bootleg file. So this is the first shloka I'm showing you. And I'm just highlighting the key parts. The burning forest was blazing with the rays of sun falling upon it. So the fire is starting, it's getting bigger. And with this shloka, the fire gets even bigger. It rose to the sky and the devas start getting worried. The next shlok, now you will notice, just notice the next three or four shlokes, how there is a strong focus on the clouds. Vasava covered the sky with masses of clouds of various kinds and he started to pour rain. And this shloka says, hundreds of thousands of clouds began showering rain on the Khandav forest. Hundreds and thousands of clouds, which means there is a huge mass of clouds. And again, like I said, focus on clouds in the story. Indra collected many more masses of clouds and made them shower a heavy downpour. And this last shloka I'm going to share with you is, is what you know, kind of clinched it for me. When I read this one, I said, man, you know, when I was remembering this one, when I was reading the bootleg fire, I said, this is what it sounds like. The flames fought with that heavy shower. So there's the fire raging on the ground. There's rain falling from the sky. There are masses of clouds overhead. There's smoke and there's lightning. I thought it was like the bootleg fire. I thought if you asked a firefighter in the US, what does this sound like? They'd probably say the bootleg fire. But I leave you to decide. But the question is what if? I've given you just two examples today of where we can actually find explanations of based on science for stories from the Mahabharata. There are many, many more and that's what I explore through my books in the Mahabharata quest series. Uh, in the Alexander Secret, I, I try and look for a scientific explanation for the Samudra Manthan and the Amrit. It's a modern day thriller, but based on that. And in the Secret of the Druids, I actually discovered during my research that today we have the technology and the engineering knowledge to construct one of the most powerful weapons in the Mahabharata. I'm not kidding. It's there in the book. It's real science, not a nuclear bomb. Nuclear bomb, we had the technology long ago. This is very recent technology, developed in the early 21st century. I'm not going to tell you, you'll have to read the book if you want to know. And just, um, just this earlier this week on the 28th, um, my new book was released, book 3 in the quest series, the Mahabharata quest series, the Khanda Press Conspiracy. But this is not about the bootleg fire, otherwise I wouldn't have told you in so much detail about it. Here I've explored another scientific angle based on very real science. Uh, and everyone is reading it. I'm getting the feedback now and it's been one week and uh, people cannot believe that the science is real, but it's really very, very real. Um, and do uh, you want to see the trailer before I close? Yes. Then I'll show you the trailer. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, so that's the Khanda Press conspiracy. And um, uh, very quickly, just before I close, I just want to share one thing with you very quickly. Uh, the Quest Club this is something that's very close to my heart. Um, and I just want to share, in case there are any, any of you who are interested in knowing more and you want authentic, verified information about all the research that I do and the things, because the internet is full of junk. I, I ask, have people asking me questions and um, I realized that they've been reading, you know, Googling stuff, which from dubious sources. Um, so I started the Quest Club seven years ago for my readers. Um, it's a club that's free to join. There no, there's no membership fees. And I post my research there. I post videos, photographs, not only mine, other people's as well, uh, because I do a lot of uh, archeological visits to actual sites uh, for, for my research. So all that research is over there. So if any of you are interested, um, you, can, you can feel free to join. Uh, that's the URL. You just go to my website, create a username and password and you're a member. That's, it's as simple as that. 
So I want to say thank you. Uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Did you like the mysteries and secrets I shared with you? Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. So um, do we have time? Is there, there's no one over here. So we have time then. If there's no one here, we have time. Yeah, so if there are any questions, um, I'd, I'll be happy to answer them. So we'll start with you, then I'll come to you. Eight hundred twenty-five. Yeah, eight hundred twenty-five. So what I was thinking, I thought they used the stones at using multiple. They used multiple bullets to lift because eight hundred twenty-five. If you just use multiple bullets, then you can lift a stone of that size. But that crane is a multiple pulley crane. It's not a single pulley crane. That's why it can lift eight hundred twenty-five tons. So they could just use multiple versions of that. Is it is it engineer from an engineering point of view? If it's possible, I'll believe you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you, but it's a great explanation. Uh, if it if it's possible practically, yep. Why not? So I have a question for you then. There's a controversy about when Baalbek was built. Some people say it was built two thousand years ago. Some people say it was built five or six thousand years ago. How did they have the technology then? <laughs> So I'll I'll accept your multiple pulley system, but <laughs> okay. See, erosion is caused by falling water. Like a waterfall wears down the cliff, it falls over, right? Uh, a pool of water does not. Uh, it has to be moving. It has to be swiftly moving. There has to be force behind it for erosion to happen. So that's why lakes, you will not find erosion. In fact, you look at that, you look at uh, rivers, you will find erosion. If you look at lakes and ponds, you find very gentle slopes. You, you don't find lines uh, like this. How did we lose information about 10,000 BC? Yes. Yeah, so, so this civilization, for example, in Gobekli Tepe, uh, Gobekli Tepe was occupied between 10,000 BC and 8,000 BC. After that, they disappeared. We don't know what happened. So there are a lot of civilizations in the past which just vanished, including in Egypt. The pre pharaohic uh, or the pre uh, dynastic uh, uh, you know, civilizations uh, just disappeared. It could be, but I would find it difficult to, you know, how would we kill them off when they had more, they were bigger than us, stronger than us, and, uh, and they had uh, better technology. Maybe, so the human, what you're saying is Homo sapiens was smarter than the Denisovans. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You had a question, sir? We'll ask for them? Okay, okay. Yep, uh, you had a question? Then I'll come to you. So, when they lifted the rocks with police, you must have found some police nearby also. No, there are no police. Then police would be made of wood or stone. They would mostly be made of metal. So, w yeah, wooden, wood, wooden police would be would not be able to pull that kind of weight, lift that kind of weight. Uh, stone pulleys might be able to do it, but you would need solid stone, which is heavy. How do you, would you move it around? To move those, the stone, that pulleys around, you would need more pulleys. Uh, but there's been no, there's no evidence found of uh, any kind of, uh, you know, those kind of tools which could have been used uh, for this. So that's why it's a mystery. Yes, you had a question? No, it was empty. Real? Really? But there was nothing in it. It was totally empty. Not the one you showed. He is asking generally. 
generally, uh, so it's very interesting that you asked this question. There are, I think, about 80 or 81 pyramids across Egypt. And archaeologists have found that no one was ever, bur ever buried in any of them when they were built. It's not that there are no burials in the other pyramids. They are burials, but they are later burials. Right? So they were buried maybe a thousand years, five hundred years after the pyramid was built. All the pyramids in Egypt, there are about 80 or 82 pyramids, I forget the exact number. But all of them did not have burials at the time they were constructed. Yep. Yes. I'll come in last because I have to discuss. Okay, you want to discuss? Okay. So, no, I'm getting worried now. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, you got lots of questions. Yes, yes. So it, yeah, yeah. So there are lots of there are lots of mummies, and it's not just we we read and hear about the more famous mummies, the kings, the pharaohs, because it's more you know uh, uh, more newsworthy. But there are lots of there are lots of there are hundreds and hundreds of mummies that have, uh, that, that have been found. Uh, if you go to the British Museum, for example, you'll find lots of mummies which are non not pharaohs. They are belong to the nobility and and you know the lower classes as well. So there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, uh, no, no, you already asked a question. Let me give somebody else a chance. Yes, please. And then I'll come to you at the back. What do you think about the end of Dwarka? What do I think about the end of Dwarka? It's very well described in the Mahabharata. So I think the same thing. It says that the sea is washed over. As Arjun led the Vrishni, uh, men, women, the women and children and the elderly out of Dwarka, it describes how the sea took over Dwarka and, and drowned it. I can't hear him. Please, 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 please. Let him. So, <laughs> nice one. Very nice question. So, the dinosaurs died out 66 million years ago. That's several, that's, you know, uh, how many more zeros? Two more zeros than the, uh, uh, the 10,000 BC has four zeros, a million has six zeros. So there were 66 million years ago. Yeah? Yeah. It's a big, it's a very good question, but I don't have an answer because everyone's wondering the same thing. Why don't we have, you know, we, before 2008, there were no fossils, no bones found of the Denisovans. It's only in 2008 that the first one was found and we realized that these people, and I'll tell you another very, since you asked this question, let me throw another mystery at you. Just like when the Genesovan DNA was examined and compared with human DNA, actually there are two mysteries here, I'll tell you, or, or two very interesting things. When the, the DNA was examined, it was realized by scientists that there are people alive today, us, Homo sapiens, not Denisovans, they're not around. But there are people alive today who have Denisovan DNA. Like Neanderthals. Like Neanderthals. In fact, it's, it's very interesting, the Denisovans, it's now been discovered that the Denisovans were the first to occupy Tibet. The Tibetans are able to live at that high altitude because they have Denisovan genes, which have been passed down to them. It's Denisovan genes that enable them to breathe that thin air and, and live. It's fascinating. And the second very interesting thing is that um, in the Denisovan DNA, in the Denisovan genome, they found traces of the DNA of another human species that has not been discovered. No one knows. The DNA is there. So just like our genomes have Denisovan DNA and Neanderthal DNA, the Denisovan DNA has traces of another human species. No bones have been found, no fossils have been found, but now we know that there was. Who are these people? We don't know. Uh, okay, who else has a question who is not asked before? You. Sir, I'll come to you after this. It's about Dwarka, okay. <coughs> yeah, so 2001, there was a survey conducted by Dr. Rao. Um, and um, this was a marine service. So there were divers who went down. And they did find artifacts. But um, <coughs> that excavation or that 
uh, that exploration uh, stopped I think in by 2002-2003. So there hasn't been enough work to find out you know what what was actually found. So we don't know for sure. Yeah. Dr. Rao was a very upset man uh, that he uh, you know that the his excavations and his his exploration was stopped. I don't know whether it was funding or what but that's what what happened. Okay, there are more, more, more and more people asking. Sir, you'll have to wait if you don't mind. I'll come to you. <laughs> yeah. Why? So, we don't know if he made the pyramid or not because he was never, he wanted, if he bu built it, it was because he wanted to be buried there. But he was never buried there. So, sorry? Yeah, yeah yours all. Uh, I'll, okay, quickly, let's take both of you. It was a weapon. Yes. Uh, I would hesitate to say nuclear weapon because there is no evidence in the Mahabharat of nuclear weapons. But um, it could be a weapon like a modern weapon certainly. No, it does not. You are reading the fake, f the fake verses that have been circulated for the last 30 years. <laughs> Stay away from the internet. Stay, join the quest now, we will get all of it. Uh, there is actually a TED talk. If you go to YouTube and you check out my TED talks, uh, in two of my TED talks, I debunk this myth and I show you where those verses are from. They are basically verses taken from parts, they are totally fake. I mean, you read, see the TED talk and you will get to know what I am talking about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. And no one knows. No one knows how the Great Pyramid was built with those huge, huge blocks of stone. Yep. Yeah. Can you imagine how long that inclined plane would have to be? A very long distance away. Yeah. yeah. And what would they build it off? Wood. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. You are like the smart archaeologists who I, who I worked with in in uh, in Stone Age. Okay. Have I answered your question? Yeah? So we don't know. We don't know how they lifted the stones to. See, I told you there are a lot of mysteries about the Great Pyramid. Uh, this is one of them. I can't I couldn't go into all of them. But no one knows how how they built it because these these stones can weigh uh, around twenty tons each. Some of the stones are as big as twenty tons. So they are huge stone huge blocks of stone. And the king's chamber is is granite. The outer wall of, or the the bulk of the Great Pyramid is limestone. And only the king's chamber is covered in granite. And there's some fascinating stories I could tell you about that, but I, w I don't have time today. Okay. Yeah. Let me come to uh, him. Okay. You are, you you have going to take time. So yes, please. His his mummy has never been found, so we don't know. So yes, please. Please, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh. The, the, the Denisovans, yeah. So they, when they disappeared, approximately thirty to forty thousand years ago. But this is again a tentative date because we have. It basically means we have not found any remains, you know, beyond thirty, forty thousand years. 10 years later, if we find that they were around, you know, we find bones from 20,000 years ago, then obviously we are wrong. Everything is work in progress, right? Could be, if they had that kind of technology. Could be, except that the the number of years does not match. You know, 
uh, because the Denisovans died of 30 or 40,000 years ago. But the Yugas, if you look at the, the Satya Yug, the Treta, Dwapar and Kali Yug, uh, the number of years is in thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, right, so... Uh, we can't say directly that it should be that much only. There can be remaining traces of the deities. Could be, but one has to, you know, one has to find evidence. For, like I said, everything needs evidence for that. Yeah. So we need to find the evidence before we can be conclusive about it. Uh, thinking of Pharaohs, can we say that they built it for the queen? Because due to that only, even today, we study the pyramids. There could be their intentions to do And have you learned about Atlantis? I've heard about Atlantis, yeah. So what do the people say before the thousands and thousands of years ago? Many developed civilizations were present, like one in Atlantis, one in the Central America, Aztecs and all, but they all vanished with the time due to certain reasons. And many reasons are like the soil. So can we infer that there are many technologies, many human beings present who had vanished from the earth? Quite possible. Quite possible. They might have gone into space because our traces and the emission text tells us that it is there. So again, the, I I like to rely on scientific evidence. So get me evidence and I'll I'll be happy to agree with you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all of you. You've been a wonderful audience. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you.